Do you have any plans for the holidays? How about taking a trip down to Columbia with today's show and you could join our special forces fellas who meet up with the Colombian paramilitary pals and then they fight against the rebels who are also aligned with the drug traffickers. So there's a lot of people to meet and a lot of places to go and a lot of people get killed. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. And folks, yes, we have quite the trip for you today. We're looking into Apple TV's Echo 3 with our guest, Oscar-winning screenwriter Mark Bull, who has created the show and is the lead writer on the show. And look, the show is quite a trip. And the fact that they spent nearly a year filming in Columbia gives it a realism that you're not going to find in a lot of other television shows. And you got to kind of commend Apple for committing to it like that. And without a doubt, Mark used his journalistic research skills to bring the realism that you want from a show like this, but also a lot of good drama as well. And he was very forthcoming about his creative process. So I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, Backstory Magazine just turned 10. That's right. We have lasted a decade and we couldn't have done it without you. Of course, of course, now is the perfect time to become a subscriber, and it's the holiday season. You could even give a gift subscription to Backstory Magazine. Just in our shopping cart over at Backstory.net, you click the little gift box in the checkout cart, and that's how you do it. And look, you know, we just published our Wakanda Forever issue, which has a lot of award season coverage in it, so it is a perfect time to get in and read us. If you want to see what's in the issue, you could see our table of contents over at Backstory.net and surf around there. And if you've never read us before, you could, of course, read our free issue at Backstory.net or on our iPad app entitled Backstory. And look, just to make the idea of becoming a subscriber or giving a gift subscription even more appealing, I am offering you discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE in the number five, and it will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. Project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our interview with creator and lead writer Mark Bull about his Apple TV series Echo 3, which is WGA eligible for TV writing and beyond. Well, I want to dive right into this, but before we do, only because I've interviewed you in the past a few times and it's still up in iTunes, I think, even if people search for it, I want to just ask you one of your last major theatrical releases, Zero Dark Thirty, which I've always been a fan of as well, Beyond Hurt Locker. What was your biggest lesson walking away from that? Was I supposed to learn a lesson? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> okay. You don't have to. It was a big learning experience in a lot of ways because of, there was a big... Um, um, public conversation about the movie, some of which I felt was off base, some of which I felt was fair. The biggest lesson is like time heals all wounds. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No, I don't know, man. I really felt like um, I've done a bunch of things since then, some of which uh, didn't break through as well as that one did. Less public recognition. But I made another movie called Detroit. You just got to keep doing what you love to do. You know, because you never know when you're going to connect. This sounds pretty corny. And I it actually is corny, but it's still true. As long as you're doing, that's my, the lesson I took, I guess, as long as you're doing what you want, what you love to do, then, then there's always a measure of, um, of satisfaction involved. You know what I mean? That's a good lesson. Well, I want to dig right into Echo 3. And obviously the place to start is When Heroes Fly. The, the Israeli TV series. When did you yeah. first come across it? And when did you realize that it was something that you were interested in adapting for American television? I know it's the most boring question ever, but we got to start there. The project didn't really start there. It started uh, actually way before that with an, an interest that I've had for a long time in doing something in Latin America and South America. I don't know when that started for me, but it's it goes way, way back. Colombia is always a place I've been fascinated by. And then I knew that this project had been... Had had been set up at Apple and that Apple was interested in trying to develop a show that worked in English and in Spanish and that opened up that LATAM market for them. And I thought that was a really interesting idea to make a piece that was at least part of its intention to play in like two very different cultural milieus. I don't really think of it as an adaptation because th there are two very different pieces. And that one is nicely specific to being Israeli. I mean, it's a lot of it's really about the 
like contemporary mind of a certain age of Israeli men who had served in the military and then kind of moved into civilian life. I mean, there, there's a similar sort of setup in that somebody goes is kidnapped. There's a woman kidnapped. So there's the similarity in the setup. In Colombia, too. Um, yeah, in Colombia, which is interesting because Colombia has a lot of significance as like a vacation spot or like Israeli teens and stuff go there. I'm not really a, th- a thing in the US. So there was that setup that was similar, but then there's really like, it's kind of like we each went our own way with that similar setup. So I really wanted to explore that initial thing of like, how do you make something that works in two different worlds? What okay. was your development process like? Uh, you know, Apple said that they had the rights. You were kind of looking for something that would get you down to Columbia. How long did you develop it for to kind of dig in and get a sense of what you were going to do? It was a couple of years between back and forth with the notes. And then it slowed down a little bit. We shot during COVID, but COVID started while we were still kind of getting it off the ground. So I would say it was about two years. I remember the first time I went down to Columbia and then I was going to planning to go back and COVID happened and I had to delay a trip. And so there, there were a lot of like pandemic related delays. This is, this is your first foray into television. What were some of kind of things that you were discovering that you either loved or hated as a writer as you were kind of getting into the zone? Well, it was my first foray into television that got made. Right. But it wasn't it, it wasn't the first time I tried. It, it wasn't the first like TV thing I had ever done. Tell us about what didn't make it. There is a piece called Intelligence that was set up at Showtime that was about a lot of things, but primarily the, the intelligence community, the way they were handling the Trump, Russia investigation and scandal. So that was like a real world true story political thriller that was set up at showtime that kind of got to the one yard line <laughs> what what happened why did it why did it die before it ever um, got a chance? I, I think there were just, there were some creative differences and there was also an ownership change um okay. there when, when viacom bought cbs and i think some of their corporate ideas about programming changed a little bit on me to put it one way and then i was working on another thing that i was really into that almost got made which was time for the 25th anniversary of 9 11 and it was about the like recreating that day and this was a what can be a mini series for abc there we wrote a bunch of scripts but then when it got to the budget conversation the our conversations about the budget coincided with disney having to shut down all of their theme parks because because of covid safety concerns yeah so that was another one so there have been those two that i had that i had gotten somewhat down field and then the the title of the of the 9-11 one fall and rise it was based on a book and a a very meticulously uh reported book about that day called fall and rise that sounds fascinating well so you're getting now into what is technically your third tv project now that we've clarified now i'm a veteran yeah 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 and so what what was different walking in on this Or, or were there things that you had learned through the other two that really paid off to help you come in in a more organized effort as a writer? Each one had its own challenges. I got a little bit more comfortable with the process of the writer's room and and how amazing that can be and how really fun and collaborative. And then it was just about finding the individual beats and turns and moments within this story. And so how many people did you decide to bring into the writer's room? It, It sort of depended on which episode it was because sometimes we would bring people people up um from columbia but i it was between like six and eight people and one of them i noticed is christopher yeah. stetson bull who is related to yeah. him, correct yeah is he is he your cousin your brother who who is christopher stetson brother bull? brother the brother okay yeah. And is this the yeah. first time that you've collaborated as writers? I know he's worked with you in the past as a producer, I believe. We've done some um, some different stuff together, but not like officially. So this was the first official. And so running a writer's room could be a lot of work. You know, aside from just writing your script, there's a lot of logistics to just getting that done. What were some of the things that were important for you to happen in the writer's room? Did you graph out your series arc via an outline? Was that the first step? Um, yeah, that was the first step. And my co-EP on this, Jason Horowitz, really has had a lot of TV experience and had a really great sense on how to organize the people's times and how to organize the week and how much time to spend on a given like stage of the process. And for the outline, Jason and I had worked together on both of those other shows that I mentioned because I actually hired him on Intelligence, the first one for Showtime. And then we rolled our kind of like team over to the next piece. And then we rolled it over again to the Apple piece. So we already had a pretty good thing going on in terms of like a shorthand and back and forth and all that. And so the first thing we did was break the season. I mean, I don't think that's anything atypical and kind of figured out what the, I would say 10 or 12 key beats were for each, each hour. Okay. And so it's to my knowledge, 10 episodes. Is that right? Yeah. 
Yeah. How did you arrive on 10 and then breaking it up into three story parts? Because because episode five, which is where we're going to talk to today when we get into our spoilers, we're not there yet. Episode five marks the end of part two. So are there three parts coming for the next five episodes? Or I, think there's are there... four, I think there's four parts, actually. Four parts. Okay. So two yeah. per five. Got it. Yeah. And so how do you um, arrive at 10 episodes? The 10 episode thing was that was, I mean, I, I would love to say that was a commercial, that was a creative decision, but that was just uh, the number of episodes that the network wanted. So okay. we backed into that. Well, so, you know, just talking about your own personal process, when you sit down to write to like, when you're ready to do an episode, how important is outlining to your process and how much time would you say you spend on it before you get into the screenwriting part? I, outline's pretty important to me. It's pretty important. I, I don't think of them as, um, I think sometimes there's a misconception that some people have where they think of outlining and then going from whatever is after the outline as discrete isolated phases and i don't really view it that way i kind of toggle back and forth so the outline can kind of change so there's a kind of sense in which i might then go back to the outline and then revise it to be current with whatever is changing the script if by outline in the broadest sense of the phrase you mean like what happens which is kind of what i think of when i think of the outline that's that's also something that's that like the answer to that question is ongoing and answers change and i I, there are things we did in post, for example, breaking it up into parts that were not part of the original conception, as we saw what the material kind of really added up to. Let's just say it probably was part of the original conception, but in a latent way. And then in post, we realized it and codified it with like these naming conventions of part one, part two, part three. I mean, the piece is structured very unconventionally, first of all. Yeah. It's not structured like a normal television show. So I think we should probably start there. You know, usually television shows like uh, the pilot has like a certain amount of stuff that it's supposed to do it's like the beginning of the show but it also in and of itself is supposed to be like have an ending typically in each episode there's like stuff that's accomplished that is that is sui generis to that hour we actually thought of this as a 10 hour movie everybody always says that it's like a kind of almost like a like a common thing to say these days but what i mean by that some people mean like high production value which we did have but what i meant by it was that if you literally sliced up a movie if you sliced up a two hour movie yeah. into time increments you know certain things would happen in the first 20 minutes and they that would literally be like the beginning of the movie it would it wouldn't be like a self contained thing so if you only saw the first 20 minutes of saving private Ryan, you would have like a completely out of whack, bizarre conception of what the movie was about. You would think it was a big movie about like landing on a beach. You wouldn't even realize what the mission was. So you have to watch, you know, in a movie, you have to watch like the whole, the whole thing for it to make sense as an experience. So when I say this was a 10 hour movie in terms of like how we thought about it, you do kind of have to watch the whole thing for it to make sense. It doesn't mean that you have to watch it all at once. Like you can still watch it in different segments, but episode one, all of its tropes that are asserted in one, all the story beats that are asserted in one don't have like their full deconstruction or their full like construction until you get to the end of episode 10. So in that That's sense, the, the structure of it is, is pretty unconventional and and I don't think anyone's really noticed that yet, nor should they, because they're only on episode six. But hopefully yeah. when the whole thing is finally out, and probably if I had had like control over how it would have been released, I would have dropped all 10 episodes. But that, that you know, obviously that's not, that's the way some networks work, but that's not how Apple works. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a long debate of, you know, do you try and get people talking about it between episodes to generate more buzz for it? So I, I kind of like it being yeah. released a week at a time. I'm, I'm patient enough. Cool. Riddle me this though. One of yeah. the things that people love about your writing throughout the years is the realism that you bring to it through your research. And, you know, this goes to all the way back to you being a journalist first. Talk about your research for Echo 3, because there is a great sense of realism in it. I mean, it, even at one point, there was like, you know, somebody's in a cocaine lab at one point. This isn't a big spoiler, but all the girls are walking around in bikinis. I'm like, what the hell is this? Like, and then it took me a minute to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, got it. Right. Like, they could be embezzling or sneaking out cocaine. That's yeah, why exactly. they're all in bikinis. Like it's not exploitative. It's it's actually part of the realism. So there, there was just like so many small touches like that 
that were fascinating. Yeah. And I'm just curious about how long your research period was. I'm sure it was ongoing, but you it was talk- totally ongoing. I mean, we did, I did do some, some beforehand and made a couple of trips to Columbia and um, spoke to a bunch of people in different walks of life and government officials and officials in the Colombian military and intelligence agencies to talk about cocaine and kidnapping and guerrilla groups and I read books and stuff. But a lot of it was ongoing because we were there. And so it was just funny that you mentioned that because I, in episode five, you actually go inside like a somewhat industrialized cocaine manufacturing plant. I mean, it, it's not like a plant like GM with robots, but it, but it, but it is, it is a little bit industrialized in the sense that there's an assembly line and different people have different jobs. So that was actually something that I had always meant to research because there's obviously lots of material out there on it, but didn't have, I just never got around to it to to like figuring out what all the little details of that assembly line would be. And I, but then I remember realizing that I had was kind of heading into a potentially bad situation with the set design and stuff. And I started talking to people in the art department and it turned out like three people in the art department crew, like not necessarily the immediate people that were like number two to the, to the art director or anything, but like in his actual crew, there were three people that knew all about cocaine labs. (laughs) Huh. And one of them had very specific firsthand information about them. So we, so I was just like, oh, okay, what would it look like? And he walked us through all of it, having either worked in one or had a family member who had worked in one. So the research that we, that I was able to do on this piece, because we shot in Columbia and we shot, we were there for almost a year. We shot about an average of 20 days for each episode. So it took a long time to put all this together. Wow. So anyway, so we had plenty of opportunity to just like talk to people who were there about whatever specific thing we were trying to figure out as far as the realism. Well, I mean, the location shooting really makes the show unique. Of, of course, maybe some of the things could have been done without location shooting, but like it really gives you the feel of being there. So you know, I, I commend Apple on, on greenlining a budget that allows you to go to Columbia and shoot that long. Tell me this, when you sit down to write, do you give yourself a deadline of hours versus pages? Do you try and write for a certain amount of hours or try and have a certain amount of pages each day? Which is more important, if either? I think those are both good. I, it's sort of like to... It- Personally, I don't really do. I I think I used to do stuff like that more in the beginning when I was starting out. Been doing this now for you know, a long time. In the beginning, it was really helpful to me to have goals or metrics like that and keep myself honest and kind of push through anxiety and so forth. But I don't really do that so much anymore now. I just kind of like know what I have to do and it, it's going to get done in the time it takes. It's just a little more laid back now. But I've definitely had periods where I was like, try to write three pages every day, or try to write five pages, or try to work for. Four four hours or whatever it is. Now I'm just like, I'll get it done. <laughs> It'll make sense. Done. Well, you know, going yeah. for a big location shoot like that, did you have all the scripts done before you left? We had done, I think eight out of 10. Um, there was a lot of rewriting that I did on set. Yeah. Um, basically all of it. I rewrote as we were going because things change production wise. And I would see other stuff. Like, I think it's important to learn about the story as it's happening. And I, I also spend a lot of energy trying to write to specifically like what actors are good at, which is something that are, it's hard to tell a priori before you cast. So kind of changing things up as I go to make the best of the location or make the best of whatever the like particular performance skill sets I see in front of me and then whatever, like producing things are coming up. And then as you said, Columbia, it was like a gift to be in Columbia. So I tried to take advantage of that as much as possible like episode five being a good example i knew i wanted an escape sequence but the question i always had is like where is it going to be where is it going to take place not as a spoiler or anything but that is answered by geography i mean if you're in a city you know you're shooting in a city then the escape sequence is probably going to take place in an urban environment you know so there's some things that we had written in in our in our writer's room in in venice california a year before we got to shooting that just didn't make sense once we were like actually there that makes sense uh i I like the way that you uh gave some some disinformation just now about the escape and and where it takes place but but so look it's hard to have this conversation without getting into the spoilers what was the budget and schedule what could you tell us about your budget and schedule for the show well like i said earlier the schedule we had about an average of 20 days an episode for shooting we cross-bordered it so we were shooting sometimes two two episodes at the same time just so that it didn't take us like 
forever. Wow. They would kind of overlap and we had a bunch of different directors working on it in order to make that possible. So does that mean you were going back and forth to different sets during the course of like even the same day for different episodes? Sometimes. I mean, usually when there were two things shooting, I would just kind of decide to be on one set or the other. By the time we got deeper into the episodes, like Pablo Trapero, who directed one and two, also directed six and seven. And while he was directing six and seven, I was directing five and some of eight. And so by that time, Pablo and I had been had, you know, worked together quite a lot. And so I didn't really need to, I, you know, he was kind of off doing his thing. We tried to set up like a real time feed so I could see like his, his monitors, but that didn't work. But FaceTime would work or, or I would have an assistant, like send me little video clips if he was doing something that we, that, that we wanted to talk about, like, or if there was like a kind of a more intricate scene sure. that I was concerned about, like an action scene. And I wanted to see what kind of coverage he was getting. So we would sometimes chat during the day using these like really low res video video clips just sent back and forth like like literally as text messages or on WhatsApp because a lot of times I was not in a place with good reception. But if we weren't shooting overlapping, then yeah, I would just be there. And and budget wise, I don't know if I should really give the number, but it was, you know, we we didn't have like all the money in the world, but we were adequately resource to do this in Colombia. I mean, Colombia sure. is not the economics there. The dollar goes a long way. There's a lot of skilled labor and, and just the economics of it are that you can, you can get a lot for your money. So we would not have been able to make this show at this scale probably anywhere else. We couldn't have made it, for example, at this scale in Hawaii. Look, it's it's impossible to keep going without talking spoilers. So we're going to jump into spoilers. So podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, if you have not yet seen Echo 3, it could be in your pocket, but don't watch it on your little phone or your little device. Go go put it on a big screen. Watch Echo 3 on Apple TV Plus and uh, come back because we are going to talk about spoilers from episodes one through five. You have been warned, you know, right off the bat. I mean, like your first shot of the first episode shows us the intensity that you're going to go for on this show. You have a group of people lined up to be executed, you know, out in the rainforest. And it's Amber, you know, as we later learn, we don't even know her name. We have no connection to these people. And we flash back to her wedding day. I think it's a I think it's a great way to get people involved in the show and to sit up in their seats and wonder what's up. At what point did you realize using a flashback right off the bat was was the right place to do it and it was something that actually interestingly you continued doing throughout the show as to when you drop certain flashbacks so it's not always linear yeah we kind of kept the flashback thing it wasn't really a big part of the writing process but it came to be part of how we decided to tell the story in post and sitting with uh, Alex, my editor, he really kind of pushed this language. Uh, we're living in it in, in a very linear present in terms of the main plot. You kind of tick tock through it in sequence as it happens, but there are flashbacks that don't follow really any temporal logic, but they have like an emotional and psychological logic to them so that they can sometimes be enriching into the present. And that was really something that he brought uh, in the beginning of the pilot specifically i was just looking for like a hook because we had tried a bunch of different beginnings and we were we were really struggling with how to start and then we kind of settled on that one in the jungle and i just figured it, it whatever the merits of someone's attention span and whatever the merits of the writing like yeah starting with like this like hyper hyper dramatic moment of a group of people potentially being executed is probably at least gets me past the first three or four minutes. Yeah. And I think it, it sets the table stakes for what the show is going to delve into, that this is like a life and death situation. And this is like a high octane pulse pounding drama. And then that gave us the room, I think, to turn the volume down and have this wedding sequence that follows it, which is you know still pretty flashy and all, but a little more expositional in terms of character relationships, a little less obvious in like what the dramatic through lines that we're beginning to build are it definitely works i mean it's a, it's a great way to start and obviously this focus of the show is the kind of this triangle in which it's prince and amber getting married and of course bambi her brother is is bonded with her as well and these two men that really want to fight hard to rescue her because that's what the show becomes about at least in those first three parts that is the focus of her being captured and what you reveal about each of them as it goes forward so talk about that like kind of stripping those layers because i thought the really interesting reveal was that she has some sort of affiliation with the cia and we know that by episode i think it's i think it's the gambler episode three 
And so I thought that was that was kind of like an interesting reveal. And I'm glad that I didn't know that from the beginning. And you could have dropped it anywhere. Did it ever float around as to when you were going to reveal um, that? Yeah. I mean, we had a lot of conversations about that. I don't know. I handle exposition a lot differently from most people. So so you get sometimes get these weird outcomes because of the way I do it. The basic narrative idea is that there's a, there's this really central very easy to understand problem, which is like, she's in captivity. They both love her and they want to get her out. So that could, there, there couldn't be, um, the rules couldn't be clearer with that. And I think what the reason I like that, the simplicity and directness of that is it allowed us to then be a lot more deliberate in the storytelling and a lot less exposition heavy. Like most TV to me is really just like 90% exposition and people explaining what they think and feel and then having arguments about what they think and feel with each other and then changing what they think and feel and then explaining that too, which is not that interesting to me. It, I mean, it's it's very like most TV is very talky in that way and very exposition heavy, which is fine, but it's just not that interesting to me. I like a more sort of cinema, I hate that word, but a more filmic story of style of storytelling where you're really demonstrating through action and through behavior what people are going through and you're using um, dialogue much more naturalistically so that the audience has to kind of like figure out what people are feeling instead of it being explained or declared. So anyway, having that really easy to follow bouncing ball of the of like the key plot, like she's in trouble, they got to get her, allowed us, I think, to be a little more sophisticated in some of the other storytelling moments and unspool things in a more naturalistic way. So I think that her CIA affiliations, which is something that's litigated throughout the show, like it's not really ever fully answered what the what the depth and and um, consequence of her connection is. I think that that unspools in a in a very naturalistic way by by which I mean that it comes out when the characters who are involved in the plot actually would be discussing it anyway, as opposed to a more expositional style of storytelling in which you would drop that information when the audience needs to know it in order to keep them hooked on the plot. So those are two very different ways of looking at something, and I think having that kind of big genre trope of a damsel in distress gave us the license to be a little more sophisticated on the other aspects of the storytelling and then allowed us to like deconstruct that as you say she's not really a damn it turns out like the one of the big twists is she's not really a damsel in distress she like has her own agency and her own culpability and as the season progresses like a lot of the tropes that are asserted about her get deconstructed and then a lot the same thing for them like these are two military guys that that are like the elite of the elite and you meet them in a certain context at the wedding and then they go on a mission and demonstrate all this lethality and stuff but then as the season gets deeper like we kind of unpack that and ask you to think about what what it means to be the kind of people they are so it's actually like kind of a pretty complicated piece even though at first blush it might seem like a simple kidnapping story even the reason why they suspect she's cia was great in which prince her husband puts a military grade tracker in her backpack because he was just worried about her as a scientist going down there because she really is at least having the semblance of a double life because she really is a scientist. She has a reason to be there. She has worked in the lab. You know, that's why the cocaine lab becomes something that she could adjust to pretty easily when she's in prison because she has lab experience. But he put a military tracker in her backpack. And when the people that you know, went after this group of scientists for a bounty just to kind of make a name for themselves, find a military tracker. It escalates things and make them suspect that she's CIA. And even though they end up being correct, it's interesting for us to have that knowledge because it's revealed, you know, back in the States with their with their Langley contact and see how she kind of skirts around it of, you know, my husband likes to keep an eye on me. There's there's a good reason for everything she says. I, I'm curious, what are some of the left turns? It's always interesting to hear about when you get a seasonal arc, something that you planned for maybe a day, a week, a month, and you really wrote out you thought it was going to be a part of this and then you completely scuttled it was never even shot we shot pretty much most of what we had planned to shoot but then there's a there's a fair amount of material that we dropped because it just started to feel like we were pulling the characters in performance directions that kind of were fighting the main goal was was more what we would find so um, I can't think of anything specifically. I know if I was like in that headset, but I but it's sure. been a minute since I kind of was sitting there and like being like, oh, crying about scenes that we cut. But I know there I know there's a fair amount of stuff that we cut when we realize like sometimes you can make multiple points in a scene, you know, like let's say there's a scene that's 10 pages long and there's the character is asserting like three different sides of herself, let's say, and she's asserting like some 
moral ambivalence. She's also asserting some like jealousy and she's asserting some whatever, like dominating qualities. It's possible to like in, in, if the plot is, is complex enough to, for a scene to like hold all those three different things. But sometimes as you get deeper into a story, you might just realize like, you know what, we should just pick two out of three and then edit the scene down Or in this case, maybe drop the other two and just go for her moral reservations. So it was stuff like that where we had like probably more story than we needed or more um, or more performance beats that we needed. And we decided to really just like commit to like a a particular lane. So that's kind of what we did. We we kind of made it much more about morality the deeper we went in and and less about interpersonal dynamics, which is a little bit of a shift from how it starts. One of the things that also is fascinating because you were talking a second ago about exposition is is exactly how much you really do tell because you could get lost in that. And I thought it was interesting that Violetta, the journalist, when she meets with one of the people from this this new group of rebels that are you know all very young and kind of inexperienced, she blows them off. And she kind of doesn't care about them because she knows that they're young and they're stumbling and they're going to make mistakes. And then within that episode, they they talk in gambling terms. And I, I love the game of poker and, and you, you say it perfectly in which they're a dangerous player at the table because they don't know the rules of the game, which means that some of the things that they do, even though they're going to succeed, are going to be dangerous for everybody else. And Mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting way to look at it. So tell us about kind of deciding not to entirely, at least by episode five, define what this new group of rebels is rather than, you know, use a well-known group. I mean, it seems like they're a hybrid of political aspirations, but also, you know, they have a definite alliance to the the drug trade and the cartels. Again, I it's be, it's really because of how I think about exposition, and I think that you know what you need to know about the group in order to follow the bouncing ball of the story. When I wrote Zero Dark Thirty for just as a counterexample, there's some pretty detailed flow charts in that movie about about all the membership of Al Qaeda. Okay, right, and and I think you needed to know that in order to understand the challenge of what they were trying to do. In that case, the exposition was serving the dramatic goal of the story, but in this case, like it's not really that necessary for me to like delineate out every contour of this rebel group because it's sort of besides the point the point of the story is how do these men feel and what are they going to do and like how much would they really care about every nuance of what the group believes in and i kind of concluded that if you're like an elite commando with like 25 years of military experience you're gonna have you're gonna want to have a cursory understanding of what the group believes and their history and so forth and like what they what they're about but really you want to know where they are and how many guns they have that's really what you care about you don't yeah. really care about what they think because whatever it is they have you know you want to know are they likely to kill a hostage and stuff like that but past that you know you don't you're not really trying to do a history lesson so it's about like for me the the, the goal of the writing is to try to be, uh, embed you inside of a story not to show off like my ability to concoct like a fake rebel group. Right. so there is actually a lot of information in there, but it goes by very quickly and you have to really be paying attention. Like they do actually state what their goal is and the 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 way they operate in terms of their connectivity to Venezuela and their, their intersection with the drug trade and all that, that's all based on like lots of conversations I had with people who are experts in the field. I didn't call it ELN or call it an actual because... There's a whole host of reasons, some of which just have to do with basic safety of the people on the show. Sure. But the way they operate and stuff isn't like made up out of whole cloth. And the and the amount of information you get about them is the amount of information you need. I just think it's an important point for people who are screenwriters. And again, everybody does this differently, but I don't believe that it's necessarily advantageous to just give exposition so that people feel oriented in a story. I thought it was That's I thought it was a great story. idea and it allows you to continue world building on your own rules because you're inventing yeah. something new. So it totally works in that capacity as well. You know, in episode three, The Gambler, you have just this big action sequence where they all finally converge. The location was perfect. There's cliffs, there's trucks beneath yeah. them. They're they're waiting, they're sniping. And I'm just curious briefly, how does your action look on the page? Do you strike out every moment, shot by shot kind of? I mean, not really shot by shot, but just who's doing what? Or do you kind of, 
make it a little more general and save something that's more detailed for a production draft? Well, usually it's pretty detailed. I mean, uh, certainly by the time we shoot, I mean, I, in that case of that specific sequence, I was there with Claudia. So it, I didn't need to have it all written out. And we had originally, that scene was scripted to take place on a river. It was all about being on a river. The scene right before it, the, they, the rebels get on these boats yeah, on these canoes. And that's where the action scene was was going to take place on that river. But I, I at the end, I couldn't get the production to shoot on that river, principally because the water quality in the river wasn't clean enough to pass certain like uh, E. coli bacteria safety standards that we use. So I couldn't risk cast getting into the water. Because if they have, if you have like an exposed part of your skin with like an open cut or something, the E. coli yeah. can get in there and get sick. So I did actually have a really detailed version of that sequence that took place on water. When we lost water as the location, we kind of, I, I kind of transposed some of it to, to that other area that I, that I found with the cliff. But some of it was a little under described and, and we were kind of making it up on the day. But it, generally speaking, I like to have actions very detailed. It's not that I don't want somebody to think of something cool in the moment, but I'm, I'm trying to, I'm usually trying to make a bunch of different story points with the action in addition to like whatever time space puzzle is being solved in the action and whatever like spectacle is happening. I'm also trying to make character points. And in that case, I was trying to tell a story about Prince and Bambi and their relationship because Bambi's like yelling at Prince. He's like, go, go, go. And Prince isn't really listening to him right? He's hesitating. And so this is pretty subterranean, but on a certain level, the reason that scene unfolds the way it unfolds is it's a demonstration of how they're kind of working together, the two main guys, but they're also kind of not, they're kind of not really listening to each other. They're kind of not really agreeing on the same set of facts on the same reality. And so it's sort of a story about their lack of trust. It's sort of a story about their a breakdown of their brotherhood or their relationship or whatever you want to call it. And at the same time, it's like an action sequence. So the character beats are what survived moving from water to to that makes sense to the cliff but then all the specifics of the geography of like where a sniper is going to be and like ha- what bambi's going to see and all that some of that also survived because i knew that there was going to be like a differential in their point of view that was like a key part of the sequence that they would have two different visual understandings because prince was going to be close and bambi was going to be far but then like the actual like blocking and all that shit which normally i would write out i wasn't i just didn't have the time to do so that that we sort of figured out on the day i mean it worked really well and especially because it was carried by by this interesting piece of research I'm guessing that you had in which in the middle of the battle when it's clear that they're being sniped at the girls the leaders of the rebels just take out this duffel bag and they're like getting bed sheets out of it I'm like what in the hell are they doing and it was this interesting tactic in which by putting bed sheets over them as they get out of the truck the snipers don't know if they're shooting at a soldier or at a at a hostage and so it was it was it made for a very interesting tense sequence that was you know the very low budget prop of bed sheets where, where, did, where did you come across that idea because it was it was fascinating yeah that was something i just totally made it up actually <laughs> okay okay i thought it was research it seems so real oh uh, it's funny it. you said a lot of people have said that i mean not a lot of people but a couple other people have made the same observation um no that was just like we literally wrote i literally wrote myself into a corner Right. Again, because I didn't have the boats. Like there was a thing that water was going to do that just didn't work on land. Sure. And the corner is they're stuck in a truck and you got to get them out. Right. They're stuck in a truck. And then it was like, well, how could they possibly get away? Otherwise, this series is going to end right here in episode three. And they're going to rescue Amber. I remember kicking it around with my friend, Mitch, who's a former team guy, former Navy SEAL. And we were we were talking about it for like a week as we were leading up to shooting this scene. I was like, we have a real problem here, man, because we we it's like not going to be credible that the rebels get away, but we need them to get away. So we were just we were just racking our brains, and then one day I I came up with this idea of the of the blankets, and I I knew that it was a total invention, and I I remember saying to Mitch like, there's nothing like this has ever happened before, I'm sure, and he was like, yeah, not to my knowledge. It's totally made up, but it worked for the story. And then I feel like, you know, there's no reason that like it, it wouldn't work for the audience. And so we just decided to go for it. And I, I think it came out pretty good. I mean, it, it was great. I mean, it's interesting that you're doing this in movements because of course, Prince briefly gets Amber back and then he's shot and they're separated again. 
which leads to so much world building in the next two episodes as we as we talk about four and five because it's it's really interesting in which Bambi stays behind because he's not going to abandon his sister. Prince is forced into a hospital. He wakes up in Atlanta because he was injured in the field. And rather than see a whole bunch of stealthy, I'm going to track them all the way, Bambi goes back to drinking. And he's he's in this village because he knows that he needs to take his time to figure out a plan. He buries his gear in the forest. And it's interesting. You have this sequence of him befriending Harry, you know, the local fisherman. And he's fishing with him and proving his, himself to him. And you're showing time passage because they're selling fish. Now, of course, we know it's going to pay off because we see Harry delivering fish to that base that his sister is at. So clearly the the seed has been planted. But I was just curious about kind of taking the time away from that story thrust to to focus on how Bambi is licking his wounds of the failed mission and basically resetting his clock because you're now world building in episode four and yet again in episode five. I don't know. I mean, uh, (laughs) I think the idea was just to try to think about what would really happen if this story was true. What would people really do? Again, uh, to try to be naturalistic about the storytelling. And I think that that's what would really happen to my characters. I remember talking to a Delta Force guy. This is a long time ago, like 15 years ago or 20 years ago about something. This is when I was researching Triple Frontier. I mean, what became Triple Frontier and asking him how he would go about breaking into a drug dealer's house. The first question he asked me was, how much time do I have? And I said, well, I don't know. I never thought of that. I thought he was going to, you know, talk about some piece of electronic equipment or something. And I said, well, how much time do you need? And he said, I'd like about a year to set it up. Wow. And he said, first I would move into the neighborhood. Then I would open a business that would give me trucks. And he had a whole elaborate story of how he was going to build out his ability to like scope out this house and get inside of it and everything. And so in a way, what Bambi is doing is like what I think a real, you know, somebody with his training would actually do in that situation. They would probably like start pretty small and gradually and try to build some relationship in the, in the community that would give them access to whatever they were trying to get access to. It's, it's so a slow I, burn. And I, and I, and I like the, the slow burn that and it's, the it's show like, has the room. Yeah. I mean, that's what you get with 10 hours is you get to be a little more, I think if you can kind of have faith that the audience will stay with you, I think you, which is a total act of faith. And I may, I might be wrong about that, but if you're going to take that, if you're going to have that faith then I think the 10 hours gives you the ability to really build out some texture you know, again, rather than just do like a stage play where you have people just talking all the time and they're just constantly just doing exposition, you can you can build out the texture of the world. I mean, Bambi never says, I'm one determined motherfucker and I'll do anything it takes, but like that's what he does. Yeah. That's how he behaves. So that's the great gift of 10 hours, I think. Yeah. Ooh, hey, I'm just jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine over at backstory.net. We just turned 10 this year and we couldn't have done it without you. So thanks so much for supporting independent film journalism. But you know, since it's the holiday season, of course, you could also give the gift of backstory to the storyteller in your life. Just use the gift box at checkout at backstory.net. And, you know, look, if you've never read us before, you could test drive us. You could read the free issue of Backstory on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, which coincidentally is called Backstory. Now is the perfect time to subscribe because we just published our Wakanda Forever issue, which has a lot of award season stuff in it as well. You could see the full table of contents over at Backstory.net. So there is a lot to explore. And you know, if you want to subscribe to Sweeten the Deal, I am offering discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE in the number five. It works over at Backstory.net. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom casts go. It would really mean a lot to me to have you support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now let's jump right back into our conversation with creator and lead writer Mark Bull about his Apple TV series Echo 3 season one episodes one through five, which also happened to be WGA eligible in television writing and beyond. Well, episode five is also your directorial debut. Congrats on that. And I'm just curious if you want to tell us anything that was a light bulb moment or something that really kind of being on all these great sets in the past and observing other directors, 
came in handy for you because you didn't give yourself an easy episode. You have a lot going on in episode five. That's the escape episode. There's waterfalls. You're you're out in the jungle. There's there's a lot going on there. So talk about kind of just a little bit about some of the things that you really remember about your directorial debut and that, you know, either came from your past or were discovered just in the in the throes of making this show? Well, I remember the first day and just being a little bit nervous and feeling like, oh, I really want to call somebody and get some last minute words of advice and talk through my nerves. And there was just nobody to call. I mean, it was just like I was in the jungle and with shitty cell reception. And there are a lot of people waiting for me. So I just had to kind of throw myself into it. And what I realized is that you're right. I've been on a lot of sets and and, and I worked pretty closely with Catherine Bigelow for a long time and, and learned a lot from her about at least how she works and was in a very privileged position there. And I'm also have produced for a long time. And so there's not a lot about the way a set works that I'm not fluent in. And I built the crew myself and hired most of those people and everything. So I knew it wasn't like I was walking into a room full of strangers. What I realized is that it's just like, if you've built the right team around you, you know, then then you have like this tremendous ability to explore what you want to explore because you have willing participants in, in your fantasy life or whatever it is. Right. So I was very, very fortunate in that like Conrad Hall was my DP and he's been doing this for a super long time, you know, and, and he had been like a camera operator for, for Fincher forever and a DP for Fincher and had I mean, just done amazing. Movies of, of, of every size and scale and everything. And, and my first AD had tens of thousands of hours of experience. And I had this really super talented cast. And all that stuff adds up to just feeling like it's going to be okay. And and whatever nerves I had were kind of like worked through by having this collaboration with all these other super talented artists, all like kind of like aces in their field. That's kind of really the great big joy and difference of directing as opposed to writing, which is you know, writing is like usually pretty solitary and you have to, you have to kind of gut through it alone a lot of the times and rely on yourself. And the, the great thing about directing is like, if you don't know the answer that, you know, there's going to be somebody on set that does. And I'm not, I'm not afraid to be like, I don't know what to do here. I might have an idea. I might have a like intuition. And I say that as somebody that's like crashed a few helicopters and organized, you know, some, so I, it's not like I'm clueless, but, but right. the, and the great thing about directing is that it is kind of like enormously collaborative. And that's just like 180 degrees from what writing usually is. How many cameras were you rolling? Like in a, like in a uh, talking scene when three. went three? I mean, in the, when we were in the cell, it, we couldn't really get three in there. Okay. Usually that would be one or two. Three generally, sometimes more. Throw up a drone or another camera, uh, sometimes four. I mean, the drone shots worked perfectly, especially in the battle sequence that we were talking about a minute ago in, in episode three to, to show for geography. But, you know, you were just yeah. talking about the cell and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that you had the, the good taste to cast Franca Potente, Lola yes. from, from Run Lola Run as as Hilly, yeah. the, the cellmate. And uh, I thought that was really cool. But again, you were building the world and it's an interesting directorial debut in which you have the best of both worlds in which, yes, there's moments like a play. It's two women in a, in a, in a prison cell. There's not much to go. You're You're stuck. And then you're out in the jungle on ATVs and going up and down waterfalls. What gave you the idea to cast Franca? And also, what is her backstory? Because we we never fully learn it. Was she a political prisoner that was also suspected of being a spy or just somebody that had crossed one of the cartels that they were holding? Franca was just like a – when she said yes, I was just totally thrilled. I mean, I, I, I've been a fan of hers for a long time, and she just has like an insane amount of talent. I mean, she's really gifted. So that was just pure – just a great thing that happened for us for the show. And and she just dove like headfirst into the character and kind of came up with this very maximalist and colorful, extroverted, really like out there version of Hildy, which was great because most of my instincts tend to be a little more – laid back and like flat in terms of how I like my performances to be. So I think a nice issue is she, it was really a nice, like variation that she brought into the, into the show. I fell in love with the character and I wanted to keep her alive actually. And I said to Franca, you know, we're having so much fun. Let's keep this character going. And she was like, no, she must, it must be what it is. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so maybe some of those questions will be answered if there's a season two about how holy. Ah, okay, good to know. Well, were you shooting in order when by by the time you were directing episode five, 
had had you completed the four episodes before that? Because you said sometimes, yeah. okay, yeah, no, we shot in order. Okay. We shot everything except for, I mean, with the exception of the snow sequence in the pilot, which we shot last, we shot everything in order. The four had been shot, and I was shooting five while Pablo shot uh, six. Okay, well, so you know, look, uh, her executioner, Hilda's executioner, is Tommy, another introduced character newly into into episode five as you're as mm-hmm. you're setting up the world there. And he kind of runs the camp and he has some straddle that he does between the government and the cartels. And he, you know, has expectations of output and he decides that there has to be a consequence for Amber's escape and decides that the one person that's disposable is Hildy. So he decides to execute her. But he has this sadism with a smile, you would say, for how you wrote that character in which he's always wearing a suit, even in the middle of the jungle. And he is you know, trying to be a friend to everybody, but wants to make clear to everyone in the camp that he is going to execute anyone needed whenever needed. Tell us Mm -hmm. about the creation of Tommy and then your decision to have that consequence. Sorry to interrupt, because interestingly, when he has his big interrogation with Amber, you know, there's no, there's no like dental tools on a table and he's threatening her, you know, they're having wine and he's making passive aggressive comments. And then the next time, you know, he's letting her know that basically he's going to throw her into the men's prison. If she doesn't say something that he wants for the video that they want to release and she calls his bluff. So, I mean, it's, it's an interesting back and forth, but so far not with, you know, traditional torture devices like one would expect. Yeah. That, that character was really inspired by like the Hollywood notes process. That's what, that was my inspiration for the way he behaves. Like he's very nice about it, you know? And, uh, as you say, he's smiling and he's pretty courteous and friendly, but he's really driving her up the wall and he's really right. torturing her and really trying to get her to say something that she just simply does not want to say. And there's a kind of inadvertent cruelty to that where, you know, he's totally missing the point. But yeah, that was a little bit that was I swear to God, that was a little bit where I was drawing some inspiration from in terms of the construction of his character. So getting getting notes from development execs kind of is 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 what inspired Tommy. Yeah, basically. What, basically, what was I'm one sure of the what was one of the worst sure notes you got? If anybody watches that, they won't be like, I don't understand how you could come up with that. I mean, it, it'll it'll probably make sense to a lot of writers. What was one of the worst notes you got? It could be on any project. You don't have to name the person that gave it, but if you want to tell us about a note that really stands out as like, wow, this person does not understand what the assignment is here. They they are missing it. By far, the worst note I ever got was long after the Herlocker was finished, shot in the can, done, done. But before it was distributed, before it was put out in theaters, an executive who I will who I who I think is a good guy, so I won't say his name, strongly asked me and wondered if the movie had to take place in Iraq. After it's shot. Yep. Where 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 did he suggest it might take place? Just somewhere else because Iraq had such a bad beef, uh bad like history as far as like Iraqi war movies having kind of tanked at the box office. And right. there was this perception that people didn't want to go, you know, deal with that. And so, but he really liked the action and the bomb stuff and all that. So if there was any way it could just be all the same shit, but we could just say it was somewhere else, you know? That's amazing. Yeah. That's I was like, amazing. that's a really bad idea. That's good stuff. Well, look, you know, your editing style, I want to focus on for just a second, because I know we're starting to run out of time, but like, it's it's very fascinating in which there will be a dialogue scene and you will be cutting to a caterpillar on a leaf. And you are not shy at all in your editors to have this style, which commonly breaks up dialogue with, what's happening in somebody's hands not as if it's important to the scene but are they tapping them on the table or you know an out of focus shot of somebody's head near a window or just all these other i hate to use the word b-roll but i'm just going to say like non-traditional shots edited in to a traditional scene and it's it's a very interesting style and and it's consistent all throughout the series tell us about kind of finding that because that's something that i'm guessing you don't exactly put on the page. Well, yes and no. I mean, I do, I am kind of like a, um, a pretty big detail guy. So there is quite a lot of detail that I put on the page. It's sort of B-roll, but it's not really like those images didn't like land in the camera by accident. And 
it was sort of an evolution. I mean, I love detail. So does Pablo Trapero. So we talked a lot. He and I talked a lot about that in the beginning as he was shooting the pilot and we were trying to figure out a visual grammar. And then in post, we really came up with this language for telling the story, which I just thought worked really well. And I think, I mean, I give most of the credit for it to Alex Martinez, the editor, because he was really the driving force behind it. And the idea is just that in in the, the storytelling is very, as we've said, as I've said, is pretty naturalistic in the way scenes unfold and and principally the the pitch of the dialogue is like extremely naturalistic people aren't talking to the audience they're like talking to each other and the audience is like observing how these human beings might actually converse so there's like kind of this layer that's pretty naturalistic and then the photography is also very I, i would also say doesn't feel produced even though it is but there's a lot of that goes into this sense that it's sort of like captured that it's sort of like offhand it feels grabbed okay it's not grabbed we're out there with like the sickest cameras and the most expensive lenses in the world. None of that shit was grabbed. It's composed, but it's composed to look not composed. Right, you're going for a verite feel. Yeah, so anyway, with all of that, then this editing style, which is a lot more surrealistic and a lot, I don't know if surrealism is the right word, but it's certainly not naturalistic, whatever it is. It's making jumps in perception that you would not normally make in a, in a naturalistic, very tight way. You know, what I, what I thought was pretty gutsy mix, but I hadn't actually seen it before. And I've done a lot of stuff where we just stayed within a very, very strict boundaries in terms of the storytelling techniques. And this one was a little bit, a little bit more rebellious and a little bit more rule breaking. And I thought that it worked really well to, to add like layers of emotion and intensity, like I, at the end. And I can just say this because it really, like, it really was more, much more Alex than it was me in terms of like bringing this to the table. Sure. I think that the style adds a, a layers of emotion and like psychological insight without really fully breaking the naturalism even though it's it's kind of insulting the naturalism in moments i kind of fell in love with it and i think that it takes advantage of this world that we that we shot in you know and lets you lets you constantly kind of remember that you're in a very specific place and the world really is like a character um sometimes just breaking that like classic like wide medium two shot close up kind of vocabulary to like look outside at other shit can remind you of where you are and remind you of like the place and the time. It's good to see it broken up. That that totally makes I sense. think so. I mean, I'm I'm also just like I'm just tired of seeing the same fucking shit every single day, every single show shot exactly the same way with the same color palette, the same three camera moves repeated ad nauseum and then the same storytelling style just repeated 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 it just all feels a little industrial and like the opposite of groovy so anyway we were just trying to be a little funky what was the scene you had to cut what was something that you know it kind of killed you to cut but you know you need to cut your darlings i have a ton of action that got cut in episode 10 okay well we're not there yet so i wouldn't know that how about something in the first five that you remember maybe myself there was a bunch of conversations between amber and hildy in episode five that didn't make it where we kind of got a little bit more into the nature of hildy's psychosis there there is a scene in which amber and hildy amber says to hildy like let's clean up your room because her room's kind of like covered in feathers and they clean up the feathers together it's like a really poignant scene that was about their sort of like feminine connection Uh, they clean up the feathers then they're sitting next to each other in a now empty jail cell as opposed to one that has feathers all over the floor and amber said isn't this so much nicer and hildy's like yeah it is and you just see them sitting and they're still in like the world's shittiest place but like it's comparatively more orderly and then a couple of scenes later amber comes down and is ready to like try to make her escape attempt and hildy has put the feathers back on the floor she's like messed up the room again and amber's like oh okay you put the feathers back and she realizes that like hildy's psychosis is not going to be easy like it's not easily repaired that was one that comes to mind but there are a couple of children that i love that got left at the orphanage on this one yeah i mean that's a good character moment i guess what what was your toughest scene as a writer of at least of these first five what was your toughest scene as a writer the one that really stressed you out you kept coming back to again and again rewriting if you needed to out of those out of those first five what was what was the toughest scene well i mean i had a room full of people helping me so i can't i think they were all pretty tough i mean the wedding was was particularly complicated there was a bunch of stuff in the wedding that got cut i remember rewriting the wedding a lot because it's like introducing a whole bunch of different characters sort of had this altman feel to it where we're jumping around from conversation to conversation and if you're not altman it's really hard to do altman right (laughs) 
<laughs> well, I mean, that's a tough scene naturally. It's not that hard to rip it off, but it actually is pretty hard. And then there's a little bit of Deer Hunter in there too, which is also harder to rip off than it looks. Sure. So you're introducing a lot of characters and there's a lot of people at the wedding. So, I mean, like, of course, yeah, that, that, that makes sense that it was tough because you're trying to set up who's who. So could there be a season two, I guess it would be a question. I mean, the story was certainly designed that way. Okay. Is there anything you want to tell us about like the lead in from 10 to two is, 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 was it something that you kind of had planned so that if there isn't a season two, it's still a compact makes sense all season one, or are there some loose ends that you leave dangling I mean, I think the big loose end is Amber and the CIA. I'm like, okay. what is that issue? What, what's really going on there? Is there anything else you want to tell us that you're working on? I guess is my last question. Is there anything else of a feature film on the horizon or another TV show that you want to talk about? I'm actually, yeah, I'm putting together a couple different projects. I'm, I'm writing a feature that's like a kind of completely different, as different as different could be from this. It's a love story. And I'm putting together a different television project that is just a big, sprawling political monster. So those are the two things on my plate right now. Do you want to give us titles for each of them? I don't have to. I would love to, but I I don't have them. (laughs) There you go. Well, look, you have been so generous with your time. And I I really dig Echo 3, and I can't wait to see the rest of the season. So, Mark, thanks a lot for chatting with us today. Thanks for having me, man. It's always good to chat with you. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks to creator and lead writer Mark Bull for being so generous generous with his time in chatting about his Apple TV series, Echo 3, Season 1, Episodes 1 through 5, which happen to be WGA eligible and beyond. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You know, we just turned 10 this year and we couldn't have done it without you. It's the holiday season, so I hope you will consider giving the gift of Backstory to the storyteller in your life. You just tick the little gift subscription box at checkout over at Backstory.net. That's the way to do it. And you know, now is the perfect time to subscribe because we just published our Wakanda Forever issue, which has a lot of great award season and coverage in it. And you could see our full table of contents over at Backstory.net. If you've never read us before, you could test drive us by reading a free full issue over at Backstory.net or in our iPad app, Backstory. And of course, to sweeten the deal, I want to give you a $5 off coupon, which is discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE in the number five, and that will get you $5 off a one-year subscription. And you could just enter that code at the shopping cart at Backstory.net. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of unlike Likely Films Incorporated in 2022. All rights reserved. Folks, if you want to reach out to me, the easiest way to find me is on Twitter. I'm Yo Goldsmith or Backstory underscore Mag. You could also find me on Instagram as Yo Goldsmith or Backstory underscore Mag. Or you could look at my Facebook fan page, which I have set up for Jeff Goldsmith. I don't check that as much. I'm trying to get better this year. And of course, you could always email us at BackstoryLetters at gmail.com. And it might take me a heartbeat to get back to you via email, but I do go through it and try and respond to everybody that I can. So that's the other way to reach me as well. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.